in uh, the state of Iowa. They are growing out at camp. We have, everybody knows what woodpeckers are? We have the great big 15 inch woodpeckers, the pileated. The big ones, the ones you see in northeastern Iowa, they've been nesting the last six years out at Y Camp. We also have nesting broadwing hawks. See, there's, these are the smaller than the red tails with the banded, big white band. They're not in very many parts of the state of Iowa. We also have nesting uh, Cooper's hawks out there. And for the first time ever this winter, bald eagles have built a nest. When they show you over here the size of a bald eagle nest compared to the bald eagle, I had a bunch of 4-H kids out uh, last weekend and we got to go stand underneath this nest they were building. And it is, you could, kids always said, we read a book that says you could lay down in that nest. When they looked up, they're like, you could lay down in that nest. It's like they finally got the connection with like, that's what they were talking about. So camp is just a really neat place for people to interact with nature and the outdoors. I am a naturalist. Everybody say that word with me. Naturalist. We study nature and the outdoors and I work a lot with kids. I really want to teach them that there's three primary ways that we learn. We learn through observations, reading books, and talking to experts. What I don't want them to do is walk away and say, boy, that was a great experience. And then two weeks later, they're like, oh, there's a bird. What kind of hawk? You know, I wish that Mike guy was here. No, I want them to be able to say, I have the tools to figure out what that bird is myself. So we teach observations, reading books, and talking to ex experts. So first thing we do, observation. I always carry my, my binoculars with me. I only stopped once on the way down, but I'll probably stop multiple times on the way back. There's a lot of waterfowl. There's a lot of open water. So I'm always checking stuff out with my binoculars. I'm always looking at animal tracks as I walk through the woods. Right now, their stuff is already starting to emerge. Anybody been out in the woods? Seen hepatica is already starting to come up. Yeah, stuff is already, and if you have a garden, if your you're, uh, daffodils and stuff are already coming up, they've been tricked by this warm weather. Um, we spend a lot of time looking around. So observation. The second way we learn, reading books. I always say, if I see a bird I've never seen before, I get out my bird book and see if I can identify what I'm looking at. If I find a track, there's a field guy that'll tell me the shape of the track, the, the distance of the track from each other, whether it's a waddler, whether it's a bounder, whether it's in a straight line, it'll give me information what kind of track I'm looking at. If I find a caterpillar, I can pick it up, look at the field marks on there, and there's a caterpillar guide that will tell me what kind of caterpillar I'm looking at and what it's gonna look like when it turns into what? Butterflies. So we learn by reading books. We also learn by talking to experts. We're always trying to find somebody who knows more than we do and then we ask them lots and lots of questions. If I'm supposed to do a geology program for sixth graders, I can go out every day and look at rocks. I can read a bunch of books about rocks. But if I talk to somebody who's spent the last 30 years of their life studying geology, I can find out why the state capitol sits on top of a giant hill. That's not landscaping, people, okay? <laughs> That's geology. They can tell me why when I go up to north central Iowa, I'm gonna find limestone and gypsum by Fort Dodge and Humboldt and, and, and uh, uh, Gilmore City. Why is that stuff at the surface? That's information I'm not going to get by my own observations or reading books. So the third way we learn is talking to experts. I want kids to know that when they leave my programs, they literally have a toolbox with things that they can do to go on and, and keep on exploring. I was a little kid, as, as a little kid, I spent a lot, a lot of time outside. I'm going to get more into that into our program today. But uh, same way we learned, observations, reading books, and talking to experts. I spent a lot of time out in our backyard making forts and digging holes. We had a we had a driveway in our back, or an alleyway that we'd go and collect rocks. I love being outside. I also liked reading books, but what got me into nature were dinosaur books. Dinosaur books got me into reptiles and amphibians. That got me into African animals. I got a six-year-old, guess what he likes to read? Dinosaur books. He's still into those books as well. You know, they always say there's a dinosaur phase. He's, it's not a face, he's still into that. I was also that little kid that asked lots of questions and by asking questions, what do you suppose I got? Answers, yes. The fact that you're here today tells me something about you, okay? You, there's a lot of options here today. Your house, all, every one of you something needs to get worked on your house. Why are you here? Okay, maybe you're like, I want to be, I want to be entertained. I want to go someplace else. There's basketball going on right now. There's a whole bunch of flea market stuff. There's, there, you have a lot of options. For some reason, you chose to come to this today. Let me give you a little insight into that. Think back when you were a child. How many of you had a wild place that you spent time in? Whether it was a little creek bed or a little pasture. 
How many of you have gone back to that wild place? How many of you, when you went back to that wild place, were shocked at how small it was? Like, wow, I thought it was a jungle, and it turns out like it's an overgrown lilac patch, or like, you know, a few trees. Like, wow, I remembered it being way more wild than that. How many of you have gone back and that place is gone? Okay. That's where our connection to nature and the outdoors started. How many of you little kids right now, when I ask you this question, I've never met you before, how many of you have a sit spot? Raise your hands. Notice how these kids all raise their hands? Did I explain to them what a sit spot is? How many of you have a spot where you go and just watch what's going on in the seasons, or you go out and you, you just sit and be still outside and just kind of pay attention to the birds and the squirrels and everything that's happening? We do that instinctively. How many of you then tr tell your mom and dad about it, like at dinner, when they say, how was your day? How many of you guys say, what did you guys do today? Nothing. Okay, and your parents are like, really, you did nothing? Yeah. After you've been at that sit spot, what do you need to be telling your parents about? About what happened at that sit spot. So adults, let me ask you this. You don't have to raise your hand on this one. How many of you did something that you knew was naughty at that special little spot? A friend of mine, Ken Finch, he's now in Omaha. He's putting together this, this green, green roofs organization, getting kids outside. He said, a lot of us who are, have a conservation ethic, it came from a, a definitive moment we had sometime in our life. We did something that we knew was wrong and we did it anyway. One of my teacher friends who's uh, brought out sixth graders from Caliland, she goes, I know exactly what mine was. Me and the neighbor boy, we went out and popped the head off garter snakes and put them in a five gallon bucket and took them and showed them to my mom. I knew it was wrong, but we did it anyway. She goes, that's my defining moment. Um, I won't name names, but somebody who's a champion over here at the Iowa Audubon told me his story. He said when he was a little kid, he had BB guns, but a friend of his came from town and they went out and they shot all the frogs out of this little pond. When his parents saw what he was doing, the BB guns went away and the kid went back to town. The next two years, there was a drought and there were no frogs in this pond and he was convinced that he was responsible for the extinction of this frog species. Uh, he was, he was the uh, director for the non-game DNR folks. He's back here at the Audubon right now. Uh, John Flicker, who is the, um, <laughs> hi Doug. <laughs> uh, uh, John Flicker, who's the director of the National Audubon Society. He had a, we had a meeting with him in Dubuque and I just asked him the question. I said, did you have a defining moment he said, I grew up in a Minnesota farm. He said, I shot everything I saw with a BB gun. He said, one day I shot the biggest, fattest sparrow I'd ever seen. He said, I went over and when I turned it over, he said, I looked around to make sure nobody had seen what I had done. It was a meadow lark. And he's like, this is why I work so hard for the birds. I can tell you mine, same thing. I don't know why it's boys and BB guns, but it, it is. Uh, <laughs> I was staying at grandpa's, which is a big deal. Um, we only got to go one kid at a time for half a week in the summer, got to go up to grandpa's. Cousin Bobby comes over. I, my, I was a, I'm a son of a guidance counselor and a Catholic school teacher, so we didn't have guns in our house. So cousin brings over the BB gun. He says, let's go over to the machine shed. You see those nests in there? Let's shoot at them. So we start shooting. I didn't know what a barn swallow was. Uh, we shoot apart this nest. I, at one point, shoot the barn swallow, which my cousin tells me, you are a really good shot. Nobody can shoot one of those. Well, it was luck. Shot it, the thing went and landed. He's like, now you gotta go over and kill it. It wasn't dead. So I had to sit there. Now I'm with my cousin. I have to do this, this evil deed here. I have to kill this bird that I've wounded. And I was fine. It was that night when I'm laying in bed and I hear it raining on the roof and I'm thinking, that barn swallow will never hear this rain falling on this roof. That was my defining moment. So the fact that you're here today, my guess is not only did you have a wild place, but you had something that happened in that wild place that helped give you an ethic. And that's what I want to talk about today is creating opportunities to get kids outside. Right now, how many of you have heard of the book Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louv? Anybody heard of this book? Get a copy of this. This, he has all the brain research that shows why we need to get kids outside. This generation of child right now, when they turn 30 years of age, they will have spent 10 years in front of a computer screen. Whether that's video games, whether that's YouTube, whether that's working on the computer, 
ten, a decade of life looking at a screen by the time that they are 30 years of age. We need to be getting these kids, giving them experiences to get outside. So um, Richard Louvre, 2008, the National Audubon Society recognized this, this book, Last Child in the Woods, as um, a great conservation piece, piece. But how many of you have, have read The Sand County Al Almanac by Aldo Leopold? That was written in, nine, it wasn't written as a book. He wasn't trying to get published. These were just some writings that he had kind of was thinking about and his children were the ones that ended up putting them together. If you, if you don't have that book, get a copy of this book. This is, it's a great book because the first chapter is done by months. So January, February, March, those are chapters. So it's nice, like, okay, it's March. I haven't read March yet. When you sit there and read these chapters, it's, he has such profound things to say that you would think that this was written the same time that Richard Louv has written his Last Child in the Book. So uh, Last Child in the Woods book. I'm going to share a few quotes, not a bunch, but... Uh, just listen to what these words sound like. This is, uh, this is on the chapter called on a, Monument to, uh, on a Monument to the Passenger Pigeon. He says, Our grandfathers were less well housed, well fed, well clothed than we are. The strivings by which they bettered their lot are also those which deprived us of passenger pigeons. Perhaps we now grieve because we are not sure in our hearts what we have gained by the exchange. The gadgets of industry bring us more comforts than the pigeons did. But do they add as much to the glory of spring? The gadgets of industry. <laughs> How many of you see everybody sitting there doing this? <laughs> he was talking about the telephone, not about your smartphone. Okay, he was talking about the beginning of television, not YouTube. I mean, th this is what he had to say back in 1949. So one of the things I really like about Leopold, and this is something when we naturalists try and put together programs, he really talks about this in Sand County Almanac. He talks about awareness, value, and action. How many of you guys are ready for a PowerPoint? 